bless you. And let us once again look to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are so thankful for your love and goodness to us in Christ. You truly are great. And we, we rejoice that uh, we are a part of the great Lamb's flock and that Christ is our shepherd. And so lead us, we pray now, as we turn to read your word and assure us and give us your mercy and your peace. And we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us in Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. We're continuing in the lectionary as we are in Easter tide now, and, and the passage is in John's gospel that we'll be reading one in chapter 10 is such a powerful, beautiful chapter all in its entirety where Jesus announces that he's the, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And we were looking at the sort of the aftermath of that text, and Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he, he uh, is confronted by the leadership in the temple. But as you can kind of sense, there's sort of a theme going on today with the shepherd and the sheep. And so, of course, we're going to be reading Psalm 23. And um, I can't do Psalm 23 except in the King James Version. And I invite you to say it along with me as we, uh, as we share the psalm as an opportunity to just share our faith together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. From the 10th chapter of John, we, we pick up at verse 22. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand the Father and I are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, as we follow the lectionary, it's interesting that here in the Easter tide and the times after Easter, the passage takes us back to winter. Now, this passage happens in winter time. And Jesus is in Jerusalem in the temple, walking around. The leaves were off the trees. It was winter. And it reminds me back when we lived in, in Gaffney. There was a couple who, uh, who had, they didn't have any children. But they adopted two boys. Two boys. One was four and one was about two. And they were pretty good sized boys for that age. And I remember baptizing them in the sanctuary and people were wondering, are you going to be able to carry those two, Jack? You know, But we did it. Of course, I was younger and stronger in those days. But, uh, but it was a great day, a great day like today. 
And um, Kay was telling me, you know, she was, you know, these were adopted boys, and, and she was kind of, you know, getting to know them and, and share life and experiences, and, and uh, it was fall leading into winter, and, and all the leaves were off the trees, and she was walking around and telling the four-year-old, well, you know, the leaves are gone, and it's fall, we're getting to winter, and she said the little boy looked at her and said, will the leaves ever come back? I hadn't thought about that, you know. I mean, this is his first experience with leafless trees. Will the, tr- will the leaves ever come back? And, you know, maybe a lot of people feel like that. You know, figuratively, it's maybe the condition of the soul, the spirit, the heart. It's kind of like winter. It's always there. And, uh, but there's that hope inside. That's hopeful that The winter will pass, and the trees will come back and bloom. Um, It was the Feast of the Dedication, and and that's where Hanukkah comes from. And um, it was a time of hopefulness for the Jewish people, because it pointed back to uh, the cleansing and rededication of the temple in in Jerusalem in, in 167 B.C., And Judas Maccabeus led the revolt to drive Antiochus Epiphanes and the people he was in charge of out. And they had desecrated the temple and probably put a statue of Zeus on the altar. And so the Maccabean revolt cleansed the temple and drove the Seleucids out. And Antiochus Epiphanes was defeated his people. And so they had this great festival of lights. And that's why the menorah, the menorah symbolizes that great rededication of the temple about 167 B.C. So the Festival of Lights itself was a hopeful time for the Jews, and it, and it showed them that um, even in the midst of the winter of despair, that God is always victorious in the end. And so as Jesus is walking around and doing his ministry, there were a lot of hopes that started to center on Jesus and people's hearts and spirits all over the land. And people were hopeful that perhaps this man was the Messiah. And of course, the occupier of Jerusalem and Judea and Israel was not Antiochus Epiphanes and his crew, but now it was the Romans. You know, the Romans were the ones who held the nation sort of in bondage. And I'm sure a lot of hopes were being talked about in this man Jesus. Maybe he, like Judas Maccabeus, is going to lead us in victory. So many saw Jesus and hoped that the leaves were coming back because of him. Except the leadership, they didn't like Jesus at all. In John's gospel, when you Here, the Jews, what John means is the leadership, because he uses other words to talk about the mass of the people. So the leadership gathered around Jesus, and Jesus just walking around the portico. And the word is a very strong word. It literally kind of encircled him, encircled him. It's kind of like a pack of wolves. And it's translated here, how long will you keep us in suspense? You can also translate that this way. How long are you going to provoke us? How long are you going to bother us? That's probably the better sense, in my opinion, of what they were saying. Tell us plainly. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And they didn't have goodwill in their hearts because at the very next verse, when this text is over, when Jesus tells them about as plainly as he can, they pick up stones and they want to kill him. I mean, they hated Jesus. They want to get rid of him. Tell us plainly. So he does. My Father is greater than all things, and I and the Father are one. That's about as plain as you can make it. And uh, it's obviously a trap. Like I said, 
pick up stones. They want to kill him. But Jesus just goes away. He goes away. Well, he went away, but he soon comes back. (laughs) He's coming back for his sheep because the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus has a mission to accomplish as the good shepherd of Israel. He comes back for his sheep because he wants to create his flock. And he tells them, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hand. And I visualize Jesus saying that to the leadership like this. My sheep are mine, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. In the end, you know, Jesus on the cross, he speaks of his Father's hands. He says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We're in Jesus' hands. Jesus is in the Father's hands as we are too in the hands of the Father who loves us. Now, unbelief in the end has no place to commit one's spirit, only the mirror. And frankly, I want to place my life and my hands and my spirit in someone's hands that are stronger than mine. I want to place my life in the hands of someone who won't give up, someone who is humble in heart, someone who cares for the lonely and the outcast, someone who is a friend to sinners, someone who can drive out the unclean spirit, someone who never gave in to temptation, someone who has the strength of heart to turn the other cheek, to go the second mile, to pray for his enemies to return evil with blessings. Someone who can forgive my sins. Someone who I can faithfully follow and trust with my heart. Someone who won't betray me. Someone who lays down his life for his friends. Someone who calls me his friend. Someone who knows my name. Someone who rose from the dead, who holds the keys of death and Hades. And that someone for me is Jesus. No one else fits that description. I'll place my life in this man's hands. You know, when human hands reach out alone to build a life in their own strength, it's like that great hymn from Martin Luther Line, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. For when we seek to build our life with our own strength and our own hands, it always ends with frustrations, for we fail to meet our own expectations. And we end up just lowering the bar and settling for lesser things. And is it any wonder that human life out there is filled with so much brokenness? Broken dreams, broken promises, hollow lives. So many out there who are saying, will the leaves ever come back again? As I shared, I was at Broad River for the Kairos ministry not long ago, and and it was a fascinating experience again, just just tremendous experience. And um, on the last day, on Sunday... The 36 of us, we kind of pull apart, pull away. And the 36 of the inmates, they're there forming. It's really amazing. It's a miracle. You see the church being born right in front of you. It's an amazing thing. And um, one of the last things we do is that we have open mic, and they're all in their families. And everyone has the opportunity to come forward and say whatever they want to say. And it was amazing just to listen to them uh, talk about what they had gained from this time. And, and one man got up towards the end, and you could tell he was a leader, had great potential for leadership. And he started talking to these 35 other men, and he said, look, we're going back out there 
out into Broad River, into the yard, into our units. He said, we've received something truly great here. And it's been a miracle what we've received. And we need to go back out there and stay together. And we need to share what we've learned all over this place because we can sense a turning here at Broad River and we can now be those who start to bring a change to this place. Just amazing. Just an amazing thing. And uh, maybe the toughest mission field on the planet, Broad River Correctional Institute. But they were, they were enthused about going back out there to share the love of Christ in that dark place. On Friday night, all day Friday, we talk a lot about forgiveness and what it means to forgive and be forgiven. And um, that's the first thing, you know, is that we have to forgive ourselves. That's the first thing. You have to forgive yourself. And... Uh, you know, we, I was at a table with six of the inmates, and there was three of us in this team. We were the family of St. Mark. And um, we were talking about forgiveness during the day, and the last thing before they go back out to their units is we give each of them a bag of cookies. And some of your cookies may very well have been in these bags. And uh, they had a mission. They had to go back to their unit and find that person, <laughs> the person that they either needed to ask forgiveness or to forgive themselves. Well, I can imagine what that person might be like, you know, in that environment and how tough that would be. And um, they came back the next day, and in the morning we met, and we asked, well, how did it go? You know, how did it, this cookie thing go? And the one fellow across from me at the table, he was in prison without parole, young man. And uh, he said, well, I found him. I gave him the cookies. And I said, I love you, man. It's amazing. I told him I loved him. And they, like we, had heard the voice of the shepherd who has called us by name. For Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. And no one, no one snatches my sheep out of my hand. Well, we're not in the winter here in Columbia. We're well into spring. But of course, it's the shortest spring on the planet, you know. <laughs> I mean, we're in May, but... Just a couple weeks, it'll be 100 degrees, but I digress. Yeah. But even though we're in the spring here in Columbia, South Carolina, is it still winter in our heart? We still experiencing winter in our soul. Well, Jesus has come back. <laughs> he's come back. He's come back from the dead, and he's come back for us. And it's not just a new season, but a whole new life, an abundant life, an eternal life. For he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Take his hand. Take his hand. He will never let you go. In Jesus' name, amen.